Welcome to Live from Size Lounge, showcasing alumni of Iowa State University and Cyclones Everywhere, making communities, Iowa, and the world a better place. Hello, Cyclones everywhere, and welcome into Live from Size Lounge. My name is Matt Van Winkle with the ISU Alumni Association. Before we bring on our guests today, I want to highlight something new the Alumni Association is offering, and that's our online business directory. Featuring businesses owned and operated by Cyclones Everywhere, the ISUAA online business directory will include all the information Iowa Staters need to connect with your business. If you're looking to grow, simply fill out the form on our website at isualum.org slash business directory. You'll be asked for information pertaining to your company and your affiliation with Iowa State. Plug in the info and wait for Cyclones to show up at your door. It's something we like to call Cyclones Helping Cyclones. Well, today we're excited to be joined by Michael Zahar. Michael holds a Master's of Science in Statistics and a co-major doctorate of philosophy. While doing his doctoral work, Michael led efforts to analyze Big 12 referees in NCAA basketball games. In 2018, Michael was hired by the Major League Baseball team, the Philadelphia Phillies, where he currently works full-time as lead quantitative analyst of the new Integrative Baseball Performance Department. Michael is also a statistical coach and tutor for students at local universities, and recently founded a company that teaches students statistics and data science through the use of sports-based examples. And with opening day for baseball coming up, we thought this was a perfect time to bring on our guest today. So please help me welcome Michael Zahar. Hey, Michael, how's it going? Good. How you doing, Matt? Thanks for having me on. Doing really well. So we were just talking, uh, baseball season is coming up uh, right around the corner. Are you getting excited? Yeah, definitely excited. Um, hopefully this season uh, we kind of have a more full season. We just had a pretty interesting year last year, of course. And so um, right. this is de this is definitely one of the busier times of year um, in terms of like getting ready and prepared. And um, before you know it, um, things start moving pretty quick as we get ready for summer as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the season last year really was impacted. They, I know it was kind of right around spring training when things kind of, uh, when COVID kind of struck and uh, the, the season was shortened down into, uh, what, a couple months, right? Yeah, it, the uh, season's generally uh, 162 games, and it went right. down to about 60 last season. And so, um, yeah, I was actually down at spring training uh, when they had mm -hmm. shut it down last year, and we started to hear chatter about the NCAA tournament. And once right. that started to get shut down, uh, we pretty much knew that time was kind of limited before it started to uh, affect baseball as well. Right. So for someone who doesn't know much about baseball or statistics for what you do, explain what you do as the lead quantitative analyst for the Philadelphia Phillies. Sure. Yeah. So I think, I think the role is relatively multifaceted. There's a ton of different data that teams are collecting, um, mm -hmm. you know, both in game, um, you know, just in uh, practice, spring training and things like that. And our goal is to kind of help build different exploratory tools, whether that be kind of dashboards and visualizations to better understand um, different player tendencies, where players uh, struggle, where they're uh, doing better, um, and then also building um, longer term uh, statistical models to try to um, make predictions on different on different things within the game. And so whether that be tactical decisions in game or perhaps um, player valuation, uh, long term projection systems, um, there's quite a variety of things that are going on. Um, and I think our department in, in general, which is still quite small, our focus is much more on uh, the medical strength and conditioning side. So uh, trying to essentially assess, um, you know, just what keeps players healthy. Um, there's a lot of different um, tests and things that teams do on players. Um, kind of hard to talk about the, the specifics, but I think in general, uh, the goal is to um, really individualize at, at the player level um, what makes each player uh, as strong as possible. Um, and that comes through a lot of collaboration. So uh, we like to think of our department as a department that interconnects a lot of different uh, spaces, uh, namely nutrition, mental health, strength and conditioning, player development, um, you know, different uh, specialty coaches and things like that. And so um, we try to kind of paint a picture as clearly as possible from all this different information coming in, um, you know, through what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Then of course, I guess the last part is there's a lot of different technologies that teams are using. Um, and so trying to best understand how to leverage those technologies um, to make the team better. How did this area 
uh, kind of strike your interest between you know meshing statistics, your background in statistics with with sports? How did those two things combine for you? Yeah, I, I've just I mean I've always I played sports when I was younger. Certainly wasn't mm -hmm. good enough in any of them to to play professionally, um, but was um, definitely more proficient in in math than I was athletically. And so I think this was a pretty good compromise between the two. Uh, I think in terms of this particular position in general, um, that being uh, the more like workload monitoring and thinking how mm -hmm. players, um, you know, are actually actively moving and, you know, their overall fatigue over time. Uh, this is kind of directly related to what I was doing in graduate school, um, not necessarily with um, athletes, but more so with engineering systems. So I did a lot of work on um, wind turbine reliability, thinking about how, uh, you know, out in Iowa, you guys have a bunch of different large scale and small scale, scale wind turbines. Yeah. How do those, how do those break down based on different environmental and operational factors? And a lot of those statistical processes that we use to kind of assess that, assess that and build strategies, you can apply that in, in sports as well to try to best understand, um, how different, um, you know, fatigue metrics are, uh, evolving over time based on, these large, what I would call sensor uh, data, or uh, I guess I would call it, you know, more dynamic covariate data of all this different information that's coming in and being processed day to day. And so um, it's definitely kind of the best of both worlds, being able to kind of do something where it's working on real problems. Um, and then being able to apply it to sports is great because you get to see, you get to see your product um, right away, which is one of the most rewarding mm -hmm. things um, as a researcher. So how did baseball kind of fit into this? Uh, have you always been a baseball fan? Is it kind of run in your family? And how did you end up working with the Phillies? Yeah, uh, definitely I've always been a baseball fan. I've always been a Phillies fan. Um, so it, this kind of definitely, nice. uh, <laughs> th th this fit quite well. Um, cool. I, did, I did some coaching when I was younger. Uh, I, played, I played through high school. Um, and then um, in terms of ending up with the Phillies, uh, as I started to get towards the end of um, preliminary exams and things like that in graduate school. Uh, I had several opportunities to work for more what I would call reliability engineering jobs, uh, professor positions. Um, but this was always on the back of my mind um, in terms of, you know, trying to get into sports in some way. And so I started kind of just um, going through typical application processes. Um, uh, but I think what uh, made me successful in this space was more so just reaching out uh, to people's individual emails. I would go on, uh, I, would, I would call teams front offices, I would do everything I can to try to get any sort of contact information. I'd reach out to people on LinkedIn, anything like that. Um, and I was, uh, I tried to be relentless without being annoying. Um, I think at times I probably <laughs> was if you asked some people that I was reaching out to, but I was really excited about the, the prospect of doing this. Um, I, had, I had worked an unpaid internship for the uh, 76ers, uh, more so for, I, I got college credit for it. Um, and so we had an agreement with the university for undergrad uh, and I got to, you know, see into the lens of like what day to day looks like in terms of working in the world of sports. And that stuck with me. Five years later, I found myself writing these emails and uh, I heard back from more teams than, than just the Phillies. But the Phillies was the uh, were the team that I definitely was the most interested in. Um, and I was talking uh, to them um, pretty early on. And. Um, they knew that I had a little bit of work to go to to finish my thesis and, and wrap up everything in graduate school. And so they were extremely accommodating in terms of, you know, making sure that I was able to kind of get through that comfortably. And then, you know, as soon as I finished up um, May 2018, um, you know, uh, my wife and I came out to uh, Philadelphia and uh, I started up uh, probably right around Memorial Day in 2018 is when I started, right around the time of the draft, actually. Oh, cool. So how, how closely do you work with the coaches and the upper management with the Phillies? Are you in constant contact with them? Or is it more, like you said, maybe with some of the strength and conditioning coaches and nutrition coaches? How often are you in contact with those guys? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it really depends on the day of like where the requests are coming from. Certainly our, mm -hmm. uh, our stakeholders are varied, whether that, whether that be um, you know, coaches or player development staff, or uh, I mentioned nutrition and strength and conditioning. Um, we certainly talk to uh, you know everybody that's uh, you know in, in need of you know analyzing data, building statistical models, and um, just interacting to make sure that everyone's able to comprehend what it is that we're putting out um, as easily as possible. You know, um, even though our job is largely you know statistical analysis, I think communication is a big part of the job too. And I think often when people ask that, 
Um, you know, I don't like giving the vague answer of like, oh, well, you know, these soft skills are really important, but they really, they really are because, um, you know, I might communicate uh, ideas to the research team different than I do to um, uh, a player, a coach, just get, like everyone, everyone dissects information differently. And we work really hard to make sure that we can get those points across. Um, but to come back to your question, I would say um, these, these days, uh, uh, strength conditioning, medical um, staff like that is probably the staff I'm in closer contact with. But when I first started with the Phillies, um, I found myself um, on uh, more, more like MLB specific projects um you know in-game tactics based stuff and so um i've had a lot of contact with a lot of good people and i think it's it's really good to to know everyone you're working with because um there's so many different things going on at once so many moving parts and um it's it's just good to know who not just your current stakeholders are but who your potential stakeholders are within the organization as well i bet it's been a little bit of a challenge for you having to be so remote from these players because i would guess a lot of the work you want to do is maybe being there and talking with people in person and seeing uh, you know, the progress people are making, but um, has that been a bit of a challenge this past year with COVID? Yeah, I, I, I think we've, I think we've all adjusted well, I would say, I mean, uh, Zoom and Google, um, you know, Google Meet and yeah. everything. Uh, it's a really, it's really powerful. Of course, of course, it's not the same effect of being there in person. You, you want to be around your colleagues and, you know, it's, it's, and, uh, you know, it's exciting when the season starts too. I mean, you get to go to the games and you get to be around, you know, the sport that you enjoy and the, you know, the goal that we're all working towards is, you know, to have the team win. And so um, I, w I would say, you know, I don't feel like it's been any harder. Uh, if anything, I think sometimes there's actually some added efficiency in terms of, you know, not having to, to drive into work here and there. Um, but you certainly, you certainly can't replicate from home um, those in-person experiences, being able to uh, talk to people and, you know, exchange ideas and, you know, be around uh, the actual, you know, physical game itself, um, and, you know, watching everything. Um, but I think we've all adjusted well. I think if you ask people in other front, not just other front offices, but other, you know, positions in, in all industries, um, there's needed to be changes. And so I think we're adjusting the best we can. I think the Phillies have done a really good job of being as, um, you know, transparent as possible throughout to make sure that, you know, everyone has kind of had a comfortable situation as possible. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it hasn't been overwhelming, but I certainly look forward to when everything is kind of, you know, closer back to normal. Yeah, for sure. When you think of um, analytics, it's still relatively new, especially within the sport of baseball. I know, obviously, stats have been kept forever. But when you look into these really advanced metrics, um, it's really a, a fairly new thing, especially with technology, the way it's advanced over the years. Is that really the biggest catalyst in the work that you do is technology improvements and how important is this analytics in, in baseball and sports in general? Yeah, I, I think if you went and watched a, a game from maybe 10 years ago, even just during the live broadcast, some of the stats that they show, they're able to put up on the screen. Um, it's like a whole new fan experience uh, as mm -hmm. well. And so I think people are um, quickly having to adapt to that. And, um, you know, it's always, you know, kind of comes down to, I think, the fan experience in terms of what they're showing. And so I think there's been some exciting new things that they've put out there. Uh, like from just strictly, an anal like, I think analytics, I still kind of think of it as almost a, a buzzword because it's kind of like an all-encompassing thing for a lot of the things that are being done. Um, in sports and, and other fields but yeah certainly the technologies i mean there's a lot of different data that's being collected um the mlb this year there was a good article a publicly available article that came out in the athletic uh by Enosaurus, uh which talks about the transition from what, what was called the TrackMan system to uh, a hawkeye system which uh, the stadiums are implementing this year uh, which is just much more detailed technology in terms of being able to um, you know, track different movement patterns by the players in games and things like that. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about extremely high frequency data that's coming in in the form of uh, essentially like um, for those that are familiar with statistics, like a time series. Um, so, um, you know, you're getting tons of readings per, per second um, and you need to figure out um, from an analysis point of view, how do we best how do we best use that data to make any sort of you know decision making and, and and is it telling us is it telling us anything important is there anything there that we can incorporate into any of our models that might help or you know are these are these indicators you know going to help assess whether you know someone is good in one area or, or not so good in another area and um so and that's just kind of the in-game metrics and then certainly there's um st you know there's different things that teams will buy uh, across sports um 
NFL, I think NFL, MLB, and um, NBA hockey is getting bigger too um, in terms of um, just different wearables for the players to try to you know better assess different movement patterns and things like that. And so um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of cognitive a lot of cognitive research um, that's going on and things like that. And so um, I think technology, similar to other spaces, uh, is what's moving the needle forward and with with you know more and more technology and more and more you know data storage capabilities and processing speed and things like that um you need folks that can um, analyze these things um, and then communicate it and so um for sure technology has been definitely the biggest catalyst in my opinion cool yeah. well you, you talked about your education at iowa state a little bit earlier but you got your master's in statistics and your phd uh in when was it statistics and wind energy, science, engineering, and policy. That's a mouthful, but uh, how much did your education here at Iowa State help prepare you, you think, for, for that work that you're doing today? It 100% prepared me. I mean, I think I was extremely fortunate um, to work under Dr. Uh, Bill Meeker, who's a distinguished professor there in the statistics mm -hmm. department still. Um, and his specialty um, is reliability uh, analysis um, in the field of statistics. Um, I think a, a lot of the conversations that um, we had uh, were largely about real world, you know, real world problems. Um, thinking about, um, you know, how things, you know, how things, you know, break over time. Thinking about the idea of just, um, you know, processes that um, are largely affected by these, um, what he, you know, what he calls, what I call, dynamic covariate data, where you have these large structured time series that are coming in, and how does that affect? Um, any sort of kind of like um, you know, a process where something might be breaking down. Um, and then certainly, you know, I was lucky enough to have him as a mentor. Uh, and then the program I was in that you mentioned, um, uh, the Wind Energy Program. So this was a program mm -hmm. that was funded by the uh, National Science Foundation, where they uh, funded um, approximately, I think, 30 students or so over the course of a five to seven year period. Um, and I think that program was extremely helpful in the sense um, of working in more of an interdisciplinary space. So um, I was fortunate enough to work around um, aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, meteorologists. Um, and we were all kind of focused on, you know, the field of wind energy, but we were all coming from our um, specialty fields. And so uh, mine being statistics at the time. And so I thought that program um, was really good. Um, it definitely gave me varied perspective, uh, you know, perspectives on different people's disciplines and how those apply to, you know, you know, different problems that you actually see uh, in industry. Um, and then, I mean, in general, you know, the departments were good, the classes were good. Um, and then, you know, it's not all schoolwork. I think, I think going um, to school out there was a good change for me personally. I had, I had um, gone to undergrad uh, more locally where I'm originally from in, in New Jersey. And so, Get, finally getting away after being kind of closer to home for uh, four years was, um, you know, a really good thing for me um, just to kind of get out and see a different part of the country, Iowa definitely being completely different than, uh, you know, where I'm from. Um, and um, I surprisingly enjoyed it quite a bit. I, I didn't have any high or low expectations. I went out there and didn't really know much. Um, and so um, I really enjoyed it, uh, especially the sports atmosphere. Uh, I went to a, an undergraduate school that uh, was D3 and didn't really have a lot a big sports program and then going out to you know a big 12 school uh where you're seeing like you know, really good basketball games and football games and you know seeing guys that you know are eventually going pro in sports um that was really awesome uh, and so i definitely enjoy definitely enjoyed that as well when you the work that you're doing i mean you've only been with with the phillies what for a couple of years now two three years yeah. So how how do you guys gauge like success? You know, like how do you how can you see um, the work that you're doing paying off? Does it take a lot of time? You know what I mean? Does it take years? Does it take like months? How do you see how do you gauge success in the work that you do? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, this isn't like a this isn't a cop out answer, but it definitely comes down to uh, whatever the problem is of interest. So certainly. Right. Um, during the season, things are moving quite quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot more short-term asks, I would say. Uh, yeah. During the off-season, I, I think a lot of us um, uh, try to kind of do an evaluation of any models um, that we might have built. We might try to do kind of like a, a post-analysis to see how mm -hmm. do things stack up with um, recommendations that were made relative to, you know, if you would have just played it in a different way. And then mm -hmm. um, I think on the speaking strictly to uh, the medical side, 
um, for more of you know what I'm interested in. I think there's a big difference between working in, in this space versus uh, if I was working for um, like an engineering firm uh, where um, we don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to um, perform like long-term longitudinal studies, uh, you know, because sometimes in terms of like assessing um, how long it, you know, or why things are happening in terms of breakdown or in this case injury, um, you need you know, some, you know, sometimes need more data. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if I kind of compare, you know, just we're talking about it before, comparing the idea of um, the wind turbines to, you know, just baseball in general, um, we have, a, you know, in the, in the first case, we have information from the beginning of life, for, you know, most of the time for those turbines up until the time of, you know, analysis, whereas um, for players or just for injury in general across any sport, um, you know, when someone's on your team, you might have more information uh, at that time, but you don't know necessarily what led up to um, that player's fatigue. You don't know if, you know, when they were younger, they were, uh, if it was, you know, football, if they were throwing a hundred passes to their friends uh, sure. outside or, or how that affects anything. And so um, we're definitely always, always, always trying to, to self-check ourselves. And there's a big difference um, in sports versus graduate school, namely that uh, in graduate school, you have the luxury uh, of being able to submit papers to journals, um, and then you have, you know, peer, peer review. Um, and then um, when you're working in um, a research a research group where everything is proprietary, obviously uh, on this call, you can tell I'm not able to talk about the specifics of the models or anything. Um, but we do a lot of, we do a lot of self checks too. We, you know, we, we, you know, we do a lot of peer review amongst ourselves. Uh, we're mm -hmm. very, we're very critical. It's a very, you know, a lot of good constructive criticism. And we try to, you know, not just make ourselves better, but make um, the other analysts uh, around us better uh, as well. And um, the team we have to do that is, is, is really strong. Um, and so um, I don't think I've ever felt any lack of confidence in, in those reading over my work. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really good. Um, and so that would, you know, for those that are, you know, interested in you know, compromising between industry and academia, especially for sports, that's probably one of the biggest differences is, is the, is how you actually do the review. So it's a, it's a really good question. Yeah. So Michael, Iowa state graduates are using their degrees to make their communities here at the state of Iowa, right here where we are and the world a better place. And I know you recently launched, um, easy CZ stat network with a goal to help educate students in the fields of statistics, data science, through the use of sports-based examples. Why did you decide to start this? And is this something that you've been wanting to do for a while? Yeah, um, so this kind of, I started this officially at the beginning of the whole um, coronavirus when everyone okay. started working from home and stuff. And I've always tutored students um, from the time that I was younger. Um, even when I was in high school and middle school, I was tutoring. Um, people in different in math, physics, statistics, and things like that. And um, I always try to relate my examples to sports examples. And um, just because the company itself um, is centered around that, I think one thing that we do in particular that's like really important is that we focus on talking about how the methods and the theory apply to other spaces as well, finance, engineering, other things, because um, statistics is such a versatile degree. Um, in terms of kind of how this all started, um, I started with the idea of, okay, I'm just going to you know, put up a class online and then teach it. I'm going to figure out how to do that. And then I started to look into what that took and, and um, in terms of time uh, and it also in terms of like long term, if it builds out, what does that look like? And I already had a ton of content that I had put together because I, I did a lot of teaching at Iowa State while I was there. Um, for the undergraduate statistics department uh, as a TA. Um, and so I thought to myself, um, well, I think the best way to do it is build our own learning management system. This way we kind of had full control uh, over finances and ability to be flexible. Um, and so I was really fortunate enough at the beginning of, uh, it must've been like last April now, um, actually met uh, someone who introduced himself online um, who lived out in the Philadelphia area as well. His name's Jack. and. Uh, Jack and I, we started to build this thing from scratch. Um, we've probably been on 100 different uh, Zoom calls on the weekends uh, over the last year. Um, and um, I've actually, it's kind of funny, it's like a funny story. We've, we've never even uh, met each other in person, me and this guy, but we've, <laughs> we've, started to build it, we've started to build this thing. And uh, 
along the way, just started making some kind of corny posts online. Uh, I'm not really social media savvy. Um, and so um, it kind of caught a little bit, you know, caught wind and, and some people became really interested in it. Um, and so before you knew it, we started to get some really good um, people that are helping make courses, um, both, both from the sports industry and from academia. Um, and so this fall, we hope to launch uh, anywhere between uh, probably 10 to 15 self-paced classes um, where people can come on and they can learn um, at an affordable price point. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into it too. Um, we have kind of a live, sem we have a live seminar series. Um, we have a tutoring portal. Um, and then um, we have more like um, what you would call like a subscription-based model too. And so uh, I, think, I think at times we're still kind of trying to figure out what exactly uh, we're doing, but the platform is actually officially running. It's up now. Um, everything's built in. Um, you can take test quizzes. You can code directly through our app. Um, it works on mobile, tablet, and um, desktop. Uh, I would definitely say it would probably be further along, but everyone involved has a full-time job, so this is more of a side project. Um, yeah. But it's been a lot of fun. It's. I mean, I, I love. I love education. I love teaching people statistics and math. You can see my room is uh, covered in whiteboards here. So um, <laughs> it's uh, it's something that I really it's something that I really enjoy and that I'm, I'm passionate about and. Uh, I can I can see it I can see this particular effort getting um, pretty big I can I can see it also kind of staying as, as what it is uh, one of the huge goals with it I would say um, is to make it uh, as autonomous as possible um, so we've built in a lot of tools to ensure um, like automated zoom links automated payment schemes this and that and so we almost become just like a, a promoter for people's work to to try to give different people opportunities to to teach and almost start their own business within our business is kind of the goal very cool well like you said it's perfect for guys like you who maybe couldn't cut it in the pros and uh yeah. <laughs> have an interest in this type of thing it sounds like a great a great fit for that so michael thanks so much for talking to us today and sharing your story absolutely yeah again thank you for having me i really appreciate it yeah, and good luck with the with the Phillies the rest of this season. Yeah, hopefully it's a good one. We'll see. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. Thanks. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in to Live from Size Lounge. We'll see you again next time. This series is made possible by members of the Alumni Association. If you are interested in staying connected to the university and receiving all the benefits and services of being a member, visit isualum.org.